of who they are and what their connection is to EV charging, uh, but I'll, I'll start by saying we have uh, Christine Logan, uh, who is the Executive Director of Mid-Coast Regional Redevelopment Authority and is helping to host us here today. Um, Chuck Hayward is at Revision Energy and does a lot of the technical work, the design and engineering that goes into uh, developing EV charging stations. And Nate Wilds at Flight Deck Brewery, uh, which uh, is here on, uh, at Brunswick Landing and also was involved in uh, one of the recent bids for uh, some of the high-speed chargers you just heard about, but also had been an early adopter of a level two charging uh, 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 amenity uh, for folks coming to visit Flight Deck Brewing. Um, we were hoping to have Ryan Keith join us from Northeast Heat Pumps, but I don't see him. Um, I know that they have um, started introducing Ford F-150 Lightnings into their fleet of trucks that they use when they're driving around installing heat pumps. And um, we thought it would be nice to have a perspective of somebody who is a user of EVs because at the end of the day, the goal here really is not to sprinkle EV chargers around the state of Maine, although that is an important stepping stone. But at the end of the day, we want people to buy EVs and to use them so that they don't have to drive around in their internal combustion engine vehicles anymore so that we can uh, save money and maybe save the planet while we're at it. Uh, so we gotta get to that point, but to get there, there's this issue of public charging um, and, and the infrastructure to go with it. So uh, thanks for joining us today uh, on this panel, and um, I'm going to uh, start with Christine and ask her to maybe introduce yourself and um, and just tell us a little bit about what's going on at Brunswick Landing and some of your um, initial thoughts on how you got connected with EV chargers. All right, good morning. And for those of you who have not been to the Brunswick Landing, welcome to Brunswick Landing. Uh, I'll give a little bit of a background for those of you who are not familiar with Mira in general. Um, back in 2005, this institution, this whole campus, was an active military air, um, air installation. And in 2005, the BRAC Commission decided to close this facility. And so in 2008, uh, the state legislature formed the Midcoast Regional Redevelopment Authority to implement the reuse plan that was put together for about 18 months. And Steve Weems was part of that process as well. They formed two local redevelopment authorities, one for Brunswick and one for some of the property that was in Topsom. And there was visioning sessions and input from the community to say, what is it that you want this property to look like? Um, what do you want it to be? What kind of industry do you want here? And through that process, there was also a really good visioning session with the students from both Bath, uh, Brunswick, and Topsom High Schools to ask what they wanted. And, and most of what went into the plan came from those kids in terms of we want it to be about technology, about the future, um, and actually they named this the Brunswick Landing um, Main Center for Innovation, came from the students. And so we have been implementing that plan since 2008. Um, part of that plan included on identifying what we want this to be and what we don't want it to be. Um, there was a focus on aviation and aerospace, as you can imagine why. Um, composite technologies, biosciences, renewable energies and sustainability, clean technologies education and IT. And that is what we have and continue to focus on attracting here. Um, things like the brewery and wild oats are really what we need to fill out this being a community. And when we sent out um, within the first five years of redevelopment, we sent out to those who were here, what are we doing good? What are we not doing good? What are we missing? It was somewhere to eat, somewhere to exercise, you know, open spaces. And so we started to um, look for those opportunities to bring to landing. And actually, we were doing great things and nobody knew about it until Nate opened up his brewery and then they were like, oh, that's the Brunswick Landing where the brewery is. <laughs> he actually put us on the map. Um, but We did have to fight with Google to literally get on the map. Yeah. I, that's the only credit I have to take. The so app. the idea of um, clean technologies and sustainable energies has always been part of our mission. And one of those is that we 
we own and operate the electrical grid here. We are a PUC recognized electric company. And we are, our mission is to provide 100% renewable energy to the whole campus, which we do. Um, but further than that, we want all that energy sources to be from on-site sources. And right now we have a um, solar farm, thanks to Revision Energy. And we have a biodigester that's not up and running right now, but when that is up and running, it contributed to our electrical grid. And um, we are in conversation with another entity about doing another solar farm. So we do plan on getting to a point where 100% of our renewable energy comes from on-site sources. Um, our consideration for being part of this program is that the EV charging stations is something that fits into, um, into that mission. We also are trying to spread the word about being, um, I guess, good capitalists um, and, and having the companies that are B Corps really invested in what we're doing here and the fact that we can provide 100% renewable energy sources to those businesses has helped us attract companies who also want to be able to say that they run their business on 100% renewable energy. So the charging stations, um, honestly, when we did the consideration of the DC fast chargers, when we got the quote back one night, there was some conversation and questions about the cost, and ours was just over a million dollars. I was like, what? <laughs> uh, I'm not even sure if we can afford our 20%, right? And so the more we thought about it and considered you know, weighing the options and that it does fit into our mission, um, had some conversation with Nate who had a, a level two charger and how many folks he saw recognizing that his there was no charge for what they were um, providing. And seeing 10 or 20 cars charging a day was really one of the considerations for us to say, okay, people aren't gonna stop charging. Um, and it's just gonna continue to be more folks there. And then also we have a lot of housing going up as you can see on the landing. A lot of that is about, probably we have another 400 units of apartments going up over the next two years. Those folks, even if a percentage of those had electric cars, they don't have a place, they don't have a garage or a home to charge at. So we considered that some of them would drive down the road and charge while they get a beer and a pizza or visit uh, Wild Oats for a snack. So, um, I guess I could stop there. Yeah, stop there. That's, that, that's great. Uh, that's a great foundation, and then we'll get into some specific questions. Uh, maybe I'll take a pause on the uh, host side of the equation and switch over to uh, Chuck and ask him to introduce uh, revision and, and, and just at a high level, what is revision, uh, what is revision business uh, services involved with and, uh, and business plans with uh, EVs? Yeah. Mike, good morning. Uh, my name is Chuck Hayward. Uh, as I said, I do uh, design and engineering for EV charging for Revision. Uh, Revision started about 20 years ago as a solar company. Um, and about 10 years ago, when Colin Berry came and uh, got, a, got us into EV charging, uh, but we've been very involved in EV charging throughout the Northeast for about the past 10 years or so. Can everyone hear in the back okay? Do we need a little more volume? We good? Okay. Um, <clears throat> we've done, I think it's around 140 EV charging sites across New England, but uh, many of those in Maine, uh, most of them in Maine. Um, and uh, that includes level twos, level threes, uh, and we've done pretty much the whole gambit of public chargers, private chargers, um, apartment buildings, all kinds of stuff, you name it, we've, we've been involved in it in some way. Um, so we do, we do all kinds of work like that, uh, some that we own and operate, some that we build for others, a lot of them supported by a lot of the different funding sources that Joyce and Lily were talking about a little while ago. Um, so we've been involved in a lot of that, uh, and I know you mentioned Ryan with the, the Ford Lightning who's not being here, uh, we actually have our own fleet of Lightnings as well as a lot of other EVs um, that we use. Uh, my colleague Dan gets to drive a Lightning around the state, around New England actually, and tow chargers put in new chargers using the Lightning charged off of the chargers we put in before. <laughs> um, pretty, pretty cool stuff. Uh, at our 20th anniversary in September, we actually had an entire concert that we powered off of our Ford Lightnings. Uh, we had six of them running soundboards, fog machines, amps, uh, stage lighting, you know, all powered off of EVs. So, um, it's a really exciting business to be into, and there's a lot of stuff that's uh, that's happening. Um, just yesterday, one of our co-founders had a home backup system installed to power his home off of his lightning. Um, so there's there's all kinds of things that we see happening with our business with EVs, um, especially with charging. But there's a lot of other opportunities as well related to EVs. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I will say one of the things we've learned is uh, all the different steps 
and the different roles that people play in developing the EV chargers and owning and operating. You need, a, you need a piece of land, you need a piece of property that is willing to host this. If you own it, that makes life pretty easy, but if you don't own it, uh, but you want to help operate it, you've got to work out an arrangement with the property owner. Um, it's got to be in a location that's suitable for traffic to come and go. It's got to have a good connection to the grid. Um, and But then you need somebody to build it, uh, design it and build it, and run around and do the legwork to get the permits that are needed or to order the equipment uh, and then to install it. And then you're off and running, but now there's actually work to do. You don't just leave it sitting there. You've got to keep it up. You've got to maintain it. Uh, you got to have a billing system or a payment system if you want to collect money from it. So there's all these little pieces, and Revision is one of the few entities that uh, has a comprehensive approach. They can and, and will play each one of those roles depending on the situation. Um, so it's great to have you on the panel, Chuck, uh, for all the perspective you bring to it. Um, let's go to Nate, which is sort of the other end of the spectrum, which is the, the, the person who has a small business that is... Um, <laughs> that is um, their day job, uh, that, uh, that is not doing EVs for a living, and yet looked at EV charging and consumers who might want to have access to charging uh, as a potential amenity for your business. Talk to us a little bit about the beginning of uh, sort of w what your business is and what um, your initial thought process was when you got into the, started with the level two charger. Sure. So, uh, Flight Tech Bring opened in 2017. We're under construction in 2016. Um, our first, uh, our, our calculus on have hosting the EV charges were twofold. One is um, uh, there was a uh, we're a Tesla. They're Tesla destination chargers. So three of them are, are Tesla chargers. One of them is Clipper Creek for level two. Uh, they're all on the same uh, level two standard, so they all provide the same amount of juice. They uh, so between the four, they all split a, a breaker. So if you're the only one there, lucky you. If there's a few of you. Have another beer, um, and so the original calculus in 2017 were, was was a couple things. The first is that from a, a emission perspective, we had consciously invested in being a 100% electric-based business. Um, so to make beer with electricity is is kind of tricky and quite expensive. Uh, and, but it's a there are a couple benefits to it on the product side, from a quality perspective as well as environmentally. Uh, we one of the reasons we were excited to commit to Brunswick Landing is because of the commitment that the grid here is 100% renewable. Uh, and that as time went on and more energy was produced on site, uh, the, you know, there's theoretical, though I'm going to try to hold Christine to it and Winnie to it, there's theoretical cost controls in the future uh, <laughs> and benefits uh, to when the rest of the state goes dark in the ice storm of 2028, uh, you know, we might be able to keep our lights on and our beer cold. So um, we're really excited for that, that medium, longer term uh, commitment. And so the, the EV chargers were initially uh, a big risk for us because while the chargers themselves were provided for free, we had to cover the cost of installation. Uh, we had just opened, uh, we were certainly not cash flow positive, uh, and so the idea of spending $68,000 on six two eight, not sixty-eight, dollars $628,000 on installing four EV chargers, of which no employees had EVs, uh, there was not a delivery vehicle on the market that was reasonable for us to invest in, so there was no business case for us operationally. This was purely uh, marketing and amenity. Amenity, it's my least favorite word now when it comes to EV chargers. And so the risk we took uh, was simply to say, hey, this is a, this is a bet on the future. Um, it paid off very quickly for us, and that the timing was great. Uh, in the summer, you know, we spent uh, in the summer months we spent probably about a thousand bucks on electricity a month. Uh, in the winter months, we might spend a couple hundred bucks. Uh, especially in the early days, uh, Tesla's Massachusetts license plates were the ninety percent of the users for the first couple of years. Um, that has, I was going to say slowly, but not that slowly because it hasn't been that many years. Pretty quickly uh, inverted, and so uh, local users. And now the problem we have, the challenge we have, which is one of the reasons we're excited to collaborate with Mira and Wild Oats on these new level three chargers, is that the challenge we have is that they're getting used too much. And they're getting, we, we purposely, intentionally kept them uh, no cost and open 24 seven, regardless of, uh, so to make sure physically they're accessible 24 uh, seven. And the, the cost for us has grown exponentially over the years uh, to the point now where our, our, you say we're not in the EV charger business, but there, there are oftentimes days where I feel like we are in the EV charger business because uh, it's a, it's a no-win scenario at this point to offer a free EV charger as an amenity, um, where especially the people expect it. You know, we've been, we had restriped our parking lot recently, and there were three days, three whopping days, one of which was pouring rain on a Monday, 
uh, that the UV chargers were completely unavailable, and it was like we had, you know, taken someone's third-born child. I mean, <laughs> uh, and they're all. Um, so it, it's been a customer service challenge and a communication challenge. We've learned a lot. Um, the net for us has been hugely positive, just from an amenity and customer service perspective. Uh, the first few years, marketing, right? We run off all electricity costs associated with EV chargers uh, as a marketing expense, and boy, was it a good one. Um, now, just times have changed, and so now it's it's a lot of folks that live right down the road that have an EV charger at their own house that are, uh, you know, I get there at 5.36 in the morning and they're already there, uh, and, and so we have to leave some post-it notes on windshields once in a while. Um, and so the, the, the partnership with Mira and, and Wild Oats, uh, and thanks to Efficiency Maine, these new level three chargers will go in the middle of our parking lot, so they'll still be on, on, shared on our private property, but Mira will own and operate as the grid operator. There's some natural benefits there. Uh, and yes, you will have to swipe your credit card to use it. Um, so it, it's the evolution of things. We're gonna keep a couple of level twos open and free, um, but we're gonna start to physically control access to that during certain open hours so that it is a true amenity and not simply a public service, um, which, you know, there was a time and a place, but um, that's certainly not our role as a small business. Thanks, Nate. Uh, and I will add, uh, a lot of the early, um, uh, early adopters as host sites for level two chargers, with a very similar thought process to what you had, were municipalities. And so you get these very well-intended local governments saying, you know, we should put in a couple level two chargers downtown, um, you know, near the little public park or uh, near the near the schools or whatever, where people can come to our town if they want to recharge, they can. And they got into these, um, not really thinking that over time it would start to incur a cost. You got to pay for the electricity and the maintenance, and so they didn't want to pay the extra charge to have a payment system. So it's just free, free to the user, not free to the taxpayer of that little town. And there, we've ex, we've witnessed some amount of backlash to those towns that were very well intended, thought they'd put a couple in, they got a grant to do it, so they didn't have to pay very much cost on their own. And now it's a few years later, and the people around town who are taxpayers but don't have an EV don't really see what they're getting out of this, and yet it's costing the town over time. So. We have really encouraged people to put in a payment system if they think they're going to keep these for a long time because eventually you're going to get to this place where um, you, you're going to have some costs. Chuck, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about costs and things that you see when you're looking at potential host sites that would tend to make a that site be more favorable or less favorable from a cost perspective. Um, and also, what you see makes it more appropriate or less appropriate for a level two site versus a level three site. Um, and if you would, because I know you are involved in purchasing the equipment, I mean, talk a little bit about what some of the specific <coughs> prices are, because there was a question earlier about prices and, uh, or costs, and I don't know that we addressed it exactly. I think Lily gave it some attention, but you know, tell people what the difference is in the cost of a level two charger and a level three charger of, uh, it's, it's probably worth pointing out that level three chargers come in a variety of sizes. They all do, but you can get them in increments measured in kilowatts. So there's 50 kilowatt chargers, 100 kilowatt chargers, 150, 350, um, and the costs, not surprisingly, go up. But talk a little bit about what those costs are and what makes, what, what are some of the factors that tend to push up or down Cost of the site. A simple question to start us off. Thank you. <laughs> um, wow, yeah, so uh, I guess we'll just kind of talk talk about the process a bit. So, you know, when you put in EV charging, there's obviously the cost of the hardware, um, and then there's the, the operating cost, which sometimes can be almost as much or more than the cost to install them. Um, so, I think that's an important thing to, to kind of open with that consideration about. Um, you were talking about giving away free electricity. Uh, if you're not giving it away, you've got to pay network fees, you've got your utility costs, your demand charges, all of that can add up in terms of the operating costs. But you know, just thinking about the, the installation costs to start with. Um, installation costs, you've got to look at the site, you need to do the site work, basically you've got to, you've got to figure out how to get electricity to where you want the, the charger placed, right? That's, that's the big thing. So um, in terms of that, that can be, it's usually, it's almost always underground unless it's mounted on a building, but um, 
you know, you've got to do a lot of site work to do that. That might include, in the simplest case, digging up some, some grass, which is easy. Uh, in a more complex case, you might be going underneath a roadway where you've got to do concrete in case your conduits in concrete and like kind of, you know, there are, there are levels to how expensive that site work can be. Um, but in general, the more, I think the, the guidance is that the more compact the site is in terms of distance uh, between where your power is coming in and where you want the chargers placed, um, and the, the less that is currently in that place, the better, right? If it's just open grass and it's a short distance, that's gonna be your best case scenario in terms of pricing uh, for installation. Um, so that's one of the, the big things is thinking about power avail availability and kind of the, the space that you need to span between those. Uh, also in terms of the type of power you wanna do, if you're looking at level two chargers, um, Sometimes you can fit those on an existing service, but more often than not, you're talking about installing a new service. Uh, that can be quite expensive depending on how fast you want your chargers to be, um, whether you can do you know, kind of a small single phase service with transformers that are up on the utility pole um, versus one where you've got to put in a big bulb and mount one of those big green transformers you see outside of some big buildings and things like that. So um, really the driver, a big driver of the cost is the speed you want your charging to be. Uh, and the guiding question for that is, how long do you want to charge for? Um, that's gonna really determine what speed of charger you need. A level two charger is great if you're staying anywhere from, you know, maybe an hour at the low end up to 12 hours, right? So you think about places like a brewery where you're gonna stop and have a pizza and a beer, you know, you're gonna be there at least an hour. Um, you think about, housing places where you're gonna park overnight, businesses where you're there all day while you're working, um, those are really well suited for level two charging. Uh, level three charging, the DC fast charging, uh, dwell times for that usually, you know, on the low end, you're thinking maybe 45 minutes down to 15, right? And that's gonna look very different. The speed, as Michael mentioned, you go anywhere from 50 to 350 kilowatts. Uh, for comparison, since a lot of those numbers often don't mean a lot to people, a microwave is around one kilowatt, right? You think about these chargers, they're maybe 50 or 350 microwaves all running at the same time, right? It's a lot of power for some of these. Uh, but a, a 50 kilowatt charger may be more appropriate if you've got 45 minutes at a grocery store, say, right? Whereas a 350 kilowatt charger, it's gonna cost a lot more to install, a lot more to operate, really only appropriate on a travel corridor where you're stopping and the only thing you wanna do is charge and get back on. So the, the guiding principle is really matching the technology to the use case you have. Um, and in terms of cost, on the, on the very low end, a level two charger, a basic charger that you know, you're giving away electricity for free, you're probably looking at five to $10,000 considering all those different variables. Um, on the high end for those really ultra fast chargers, those are probably starting at maybe $200,000 per port um, to, you know, well more than that, depending on a lot of the various factors. So, that cover everything in your question? Pretty much. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, little footnote on what Chuck just said about the cost of chargers themselves. If if you have an EV and you want to, and you have a uh, off street parking, and you want to put a charge, you want to charge at home. You can buy one of those connectors off the internet for 350 bucks. Uh, your electrician can install it, um, and you know you're up and running at home, so you charge overnight. And studies show that 90% of EV charging is done at home uh, across the country. That will probably that percentage will probably start to decline over time as EV penetrates the market, and so you have more people who live in apartments who don't have the ability to charge at home. But for now, just keep in your mind that most people wake up in the morning with a full battery, just like I did with this when I got up this morning, I had a full battery. And uh, my EV has a range of 220 miles. I'm not going 220 miles today, so I don't need to recharge out in public. I will be driving to work, I will be driving to here, and then to Augusta, and then home. That'll be fine. I'll be fine with that. So I don't need an EV, a public EV charger today. Um, if I were going to drive to Bangor and home, I would. Um, but um, so 
there is a you know you need to be thoughtful about what your what your use need is going to be. I think it's particularly difficult in this very early stage where um, there are only ten thousand EVs roughly registered in Maine right now, um, but we get tons of vacation traffic, and a lot of those folks are increasingly have EVs. And I think it's going to take off. I think it's going to take off the same way heat pumps have taken off. It's just a better widget. It's better than your old car, and you're going to prefer it. And the manufacturers are introducing a whole lot of new models. You know, for the last 10 years, there were just a handful of choices uh, and the very limited price ranges, and most of it was at the higher price range. And I think as that starts to come down, um, lots of studies are showing that the the key price driver of the vehicle itself is the battery cost, and those battery costs are coming down pretty dramatically, and that's gonna really help bring the cost of the overall vehicle down, and I think you're gonna see it move into the marketplace very aggressively over the next, uh, you know, through the remainder of this decade. When that happens, imagine that suddenly one in every five cars driving around Maine, two in every five cars driving around Maine, they're not all going to be charging at home, and they're sometimes going to be taking that longer trip to Bangor, and they're going to need a place to fast charge. So I think they're going to start to see quite a bit more traffic. Um, I wonder, Christine, if you could talk a little bit about when you are, from your perspective at, here at Brunswick Landing, what, you know, do you think you're going to be adding more chargers over time, or do you think this is going to hold you for a while? What was sort of your thought process on on taking the leap and making this a host site for um, this first round of uh, high-speed chargers from the NEBI funding. So right now, currently, we do have a level two charger that is in the front parking lot of Tech Place. That is up and running, so if you need to charge today, go check it out. But you'll have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and the DC fast chargers are certainly, like I said, was a consideration. We have about 2,500 people that work here on the landing. So that was part of the consideration. The housing that's going up is part of the consideration. What I think about in terms of the future, if these four chargers go well and they get used quite a bit and we see that there's demand, the next step I think would be looking at adding additional chargers in that same front parking lot um, by Tech Place because it'll be right across the street from the town is putting in a recreation facility. So when they would be drawing a lot of people to that facility, they could go in there to play pickleball, go in there to play basketball, soccer tournaments, things like that. And so it would be a great location for folks to be able to um, plug in while they're using the recreation facility. And again, it'll come down to cost too, of what we, you know, I think, uh, and Woody Bartley is here. He's our utilities director. Um, much more knowledgeable than me in all the details, but our the cost of our level two charger, I believe was around $50,000 to, to put in and compared to a million dollars for what we're putting in now. Um, so it'll we'll have to be looking at cost, but that location across from the Rex facility could be a good spot for level two because people will be there for a little bit longer. Um, you just said something that reminded me, the reason I mentioned that you can buy an EV charger, a level two charger for your home for $350, is that that's pretty simple, but if you're gonna be offering your chargers up as a as a uh, public place to charge, they need to be more uh, robust. They need to be engineered, um, or I think they sometimes call them ruggedized, uh, or commercial style. So that's where you see this, and they also need a payment system. And so, well, they don't need a payment system. It should happen. <laughs> if, if, if they, if as I predict, they're going to need or want a payment system, you suddenly introduce additional costs. So you have the cost of a subscription, or what they call networking. Uh, so some way to communicate with the internet to um, then be able to process payments, whether it's credit card payments or some kind of proprietary payment system. Those are, you know, somebody's trying to make a business doing that, and so there's a cost to that, and it, it's, uh, I forget what it is, it's like a couple thousand dollars a year, I think, per port. Um, there's maintenance, I don't know, Chuck, maybe you could talk a little bit about what, or, or Nate, from your perspective, like what has been the ongoing maintenance cost? Because I think people think, oh, it's just a post, you stick it in the ground, you're done. Um, you don't, that, that's the end of the cost. But what, what do you see for ongoing 
uh, maintenance and operations costs, not including the electricity, but the other components of the system. Yeah, um, so I think there's some things that are site related with maintenance that I'll, I'll leave to Nate to talk about those, but in terms of the actual charger, uh, the network is, is a really um, important thing to consider. Uh, it can, you know, from for a level two port, it could be a couple hundred dollars a year. Uh, to a fast charger, it could be a few thousand dollars a year. And that's the software that allows the, the driver to plug in, activate, start a charge, pay for the charging, make sure you get paid for it as the owner. Um, so it's a really important decision, right? And a lot of times the case with that is you get what you pay for, right? There are cheap options, but they might not have the best support. And if something goes wrong, you know, we were talking about that being one of the big reasons that a lot of charging doesn't work because that network connection is lost. Um, so you can, you can choose a cheaper one, but a lot of times, you know, you won't have the support if something does go wrong, whereas the more expensive ones have better customer support teams, better reliability, and it's one of those things you kind of get what you pay for. Um, so that's, that's one of the big things to consider that. Uh, the cost for electricity, um, I know you've heard demand charges come up a number of times today. Uh, you know, looking at that, you talk the installation costs, over five to 10 years, your demand charges might cost just as much as the installation cost is up front um, for level two chargers and fast chargers combined. You know, that's, that's true. Um, there's also other maintenance issues with the chargers. You know, sometimes um, things will go wrong. There's parts that break. Uh, the rugged connectors, those get dropped when they're cold. They get run over by cars, plastic breaks. Um, those need to be replaced sometimes. Uh, you know, there's components especially with fast charging, you're talking about pretty complicated electronics that create a lot of heat, and heat is uh, <coughs> terrible for electronics, so parts will go bad sometimes and need to be swapped out. Um, screens stop working, things like that. Anything that you have with basically any electronic technology um, can happen there. Um, but I think those are, are some of the big things to consider, um, as well as you know insurance, uh, could be vandalism related costs, and. Um, Sometimes you have to pay a site host, you know, whether if you're renting that land from someone who owns it and they're not the ones operating and owning the charger, there may be some kind of lease that you're paying to. So there's, a, there's various things that can go in there. They're gonna be different for every site, uh, but I think that's some of the big categories uh, in terms of like the, the charger business model for, for that. Nate, I think you mentioned that you uh, had learned some lessons along the way about uh, some of these other costs that you maybe hadn't thought of at the outset. Can you? Uh, give us some particulars on your experience. Yeah, I'll start with a compliment that I wasn't paid for ahead of time, but maybe someone will buy me coffee afterwards to revision, which is that uh, I'll, I'll, the, the installation was done really well. And we have the, I mean, our, our, if you go by Flytech, you can see we've got three Teslas and one Clipper Creek, and there's literally one button on each charger. So we've got the like the, the basic charger that uh, there's very, there's as few things could break as possible on these things. Uh, and there's and the one button is a reset button. I haven't had to use the reset button ever. Uh, and so the, the installation was done well. Um, the, the biggest problem we have is, is EV etiquette seems to have just completely gone away. And so people think that when they're unplugged, they like to just like throw it in the air sometimes and just <laughs> see a spaghetti on the floor, on the ground. Um, so that's our, our, our challenge. Just, that's all the tertiary costs. So it's all the things that I never thought about that we didn't experience until the first snowfall, which is that uh, it's a real pain in the butt to clear snow around the chargers. And so it's one thing to pay your you know, plow guy to clear the parking lot. It's another thing to spend an extra 20 minutes shoveling out the EV chargers. It sounds little. Um, but it's a, it's a crisis when someone really needs to charge that morning. Um, and so it's, it's little thing planning like that, that if you can think about the way the site is used before installation in all seasons, those are the things we did not think through that ended up being, you know, not necessarily in real dollars sense a cost, but a huge time cost um, to discover the problem and then try to fix it. Um, and I, I just wanted to offer a couple of just pragmatic solutions that I've, I've seen and talked with some other folks, uh, other small business owners have reached out about how we're managing it with employees and all that. Um, a couple of clever solutions I, I've heard that have worked well is you get a really simple charger, you get a $50 custom metal sign that says, you know, employee use only or only available during X and Y hours. You get the simplest charger you can, uh, you can, you can find mechanically, no payment system, no whatever, and there's a padlock on it, right? Or there's a cutoff switch just inside the office. And uh, it, you know, at the end of the day, it, that's not for a public place, right? We wouldn't want that for our customers to roll up and wonder why the heck isn't it working. Um, but for, for like if we were to install, we, we considered installing one behind our building for employee and fleet use uh, in the future, and that, that was going to be our solution. It's just leverage a cutoff switch so that you know if we're if we're done for the day, you flip it off so no one takes advantage of it from midnight to four. 
So, I mean, there's some sort of practical solutions depending on the site uh, for use, but there's also from a maintenance perspective, um, our, our biggest challenge has been making sure the site is usable in a general sense. And so if you have these baked into your original site plan because you're renovating or you're building something new, um, you know, hopefully you've got a site engineer that can take that into account and is familiar with the use case. Um, if they're not, and I, we just had a conversation with, uh, so our parking lot was just restriped recently, and the striping company had done this a couple times, but they were still, frankly, trying to figure out, uh, we, we went from, this sounds really, I nerded out on parking lot stuff last week. Um, you know, uh, our, our spots were straight lines before, right? And now they're angled. Well, uh, there are some EVs with uh, a plug port in the rear of the vehicle, and depending on where in the front of the parking space the, the charger is, the cord might not be long enough to reach over the vehicle, or under, I mean, you have to go like under the vehicle, and under the, it's very awkward, right? And because we now have angled slots. And so that's not the case with every vehicle. And of course, because it's a one way, you can't really back into it the right direction, depending on the vehicle, right? So it's all these little quirks, uh, and, and the EV charger was placed first before we strike the lot. So lesson learned, you know, there's some just basic things that you, 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 you we, we haven't had to think about before until uh, recently that um, make, uh, you know, it's one thing to offer it, it's another thing for it to have people easily use it. And so if you actually want this thing to be used, um, it's all the things that you don't think about that are generally the biggest hurdle. And if you're using public funds, um, you need to be ADA compliant. Yep. Um, so depending on how many spaces you're putting in, at least one of them, mm -hmm. Uh, you may trigger the requirement to have at least one of them in the ADA compliant and big enough uh, for a uh, you know, person to roll out in a wheelchair and, and get access to the, to the charger itself. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Yeah. I just want to add, so we're purchasing our charging stations through a company called Enersys. They don't have local reps right here all the time. And, and so what we've arranged for these new DC fast chargers is Enersys will always be the folks that have to do the maintenance on our battery, but they're going to train our electricians, we use uh, Enterprise Electric, and they're gonna put them through a program and train them so that they can do any of the other fixes to the actual podiums or anything, like the lights or switches or anything like that that might um, go down on the system. So to Poppy's question about, you know, is it gonna be available most of the time and meeting the 97% up, um, that will help us meet that goal by having somebody local be able to, to service them if they need and they're never going to break. <laughs> uh, and, and I'll add that um, a lot of some of the bigger national um, vendors that sell the equipment and or the networking services, they also have extended maintenance plans that you can buy, uh, which I, we see a lot of smaller host sites do. If they're having putting in a couple level twos, but they're uh, they're a public library, so they don't want to have uh, this arrangement with their local electrician. They just want somebody else to deal with it. That is a pathway for a for a fee. So, can I, can I, I know Ryan's not here from um, RTC heat pumps, but he, he came by my house to fix something with wrong with the heat pump that they installed. And we were chatting about EVs because he had his <laughs> brand new F-150 electric, and just a couple nuggets he shared that were relevant to the conversation. They, they have a program, this is all secondhand, so I can't speak to the details, but he, um, he was pretty excited in that they, they, for them, they did the calculus. It was better and more efficient to have, uh, to give, to pay for the installation of EV level two chargers at employees' homes than it was to put more chargers at the office. And so it goes back to, I love your cell phone metaphor, Michael, and that, it, you know, like we all have that habit, right? We don't, like, oh no, I have a four hour car ride. What am I gonna do with my phone, right? Uh, it, it's a, look, our phone slapped four hours of battery, hopefully, at this point, but. Um, so the mindset shift here is a little bit uh, of that, in that it's it's much better for everyone to get us, it, it was cheaper for the company, and from a mindset perspective, less risk, to say, all right, we're gonna give you a stipend to cover electricity every month, and we're gonna pay to have a level two charger installed at your home, rather than put a huge bill at an office building you might be leasing, so you're, you know, from a financial perspective, you may not get that return of the infrastructure you're putting in, and then you have to fight over the charger, and everybody's got work from home, blah, blah, blah. So um, I think part of that is the, the sort of disaggregation, it's, it's, you know, having it in public spaces and having it in a, a central location is important too, but, um, you know, on a practical level, if you can start your day with a full battery and that's important for your work, um, you know, that might be better money spent. I, I want to, I, I want to get to what I know was a question from the first session that I, uh, I bumped into this session. So you had a question I want to get to. I, I do want to take a second and just emphasize that point Ryan was making. I don't think most people appreciate 
uh, what, what we mean when we say demand charges. Uh, it's, it's insider speak for, so uh, if, you're a, if you're a commercial uh, entity and you get your electricity uh, from Central Maine Power or, or Burson or any, you know, the local utility, not any local utility, but those two big utilities, part, one element of how your electric bill is calculated mm -hmm. is demand charges. So part of it is volumetric, how many kilowatt hours do you use for the month? And as residents, we're all familiar with that because that's how our uh, residential electric bill is calculated. But if you're a business above a certain size, you have this other component called the demand charge. So you take whatever was the maximum kilowatt uh, demand that you had at any moment during that month, and, uh, and then you multiply that times a rate and you know it, it's different in different uh, areas and for different size customers. But let's just say it was twenty dollars per kilowatt. So if you, if your maximum demand during that month was a hundred kilowatts at one moment, then you would multiply a hundred times twenty dollars. That would be two thousand dollars. So your electric bill that month would include a two thousand dollar charge. If you have a Ford F one fifty Lightning. That charges has a charger that will take one, I think, 150 kW at one moment, and you, you're going to consume your demand in that moment. Plugging in one is going to be 150, right? Yeah, 150 kW. So you're going to have a demand charge of 150 times whatever the, the rate is. If you are installing a Nevi compliant charging station, you have to put in a minimum of four of these chargers that will take 150. So if four F-150 Lightnings pulled up simultaneously and all plugged in at the same time, you would have 600 kW at a moment, and that would set your demand charge. So do the math. I mean, you could be looking at tens of thousands of dollars. So this is why Ryan says your demand charges, your operating costs over the course of the five years could well exceed what the capital costs were. So this needs to be a, so you could avoid, one way you could avoid that would be to say, well, I'm not putting in that big of a charger. I'm gonna put in a 50 kW charger. It'll still charge a Ford F-150, just not as fast. Um, and so you need to know what your needs are. If you're on the turnpike, we probably wanna put in the biggest, highest speed chargers there are because people are in a hurry and they don't wanna sit there. If you can afford to wait an extra 20 or 30 minutes, you might save a whole bunch of money by not putting in a 150, but putting in something smaller, or not putting in four of them. Maybe just put in two of them. Or uh, using some of these systems that um, Christine's talked about where you have a battery that's a component of it so you can balance out how much you're drawing off the grid at any given moment. It's a, it's a really significant cost, and so you're gonna wanna, if you're interested in this, you need to talk to somebody like Chuck and the folks at Revision to help you calculate out what that would be. Um, so before I forget, I, I want to take your question in the back so we make sure we get to it. And I'd love to open it up to questions. Sure. So the, the question was, at, at what point does the site owner uh, begin to incur the costs for the electrical installation versus the utility? Is it meter? Is it old? Is it a transformer? Is it different in every case? Uh, or what? Because uh, something tells me not all of these are, uh, are standard. And I'm also wondering if it is at the meter, if there are ever utility costs that are passed on to the site owner, or if all of that is just covered in the demand charge over time. Uh, I'll start with Chuck and then maybe Alex can, can speak to some of that too if uh, you want to be more specific. Yeah, um, the simplest answer is it depends. Um, <laughs> because unfortunately it, it depends on both whether you have a single phase or a three phase service. Um, it depends on whether you have pull mounted transformers or pad mounted and a lot of that's going to depend on how fast the charger is um, that you want to put in or how many charges you want to put in that's going to determine the size service you need. Um, in some cases, there's very little utility side cost after the meter if you're putting in fewer, slower chargers. Um, if you're looking at the faster chargers, like at a Nevi site, you know, there may be uh, 
you know, we've, we've had sites, fast charging sites that have cost anywhere from, I think, 30 to 60,000 in Maine for utility side costs. Um, we've had others in New Hampshire that had underground primary and were closer to 100,000. Um, and that's every, that's, you know, kind of before the meter parts too, right? You still have to install the meter yourself, put in the vault that the utility can put the transformer on in those cases. So some of the scope is like on the side of the customer as well as what they pay to the utility for the work the utility does. So uh, the, in general, the faster the charger or the, the more number of ports you have, the higher those are gonna be. Um, but in the, the simplest case, if you're talking about like some level twos at a, you know, at a, at a, a workplace, just a couple of ports, um, they're, they're pretty minimal for those, those costs. Yeah, go ahead. Can you, can you introduce yourself to so I'm Aaron Smith and I work for Central Maine Power. So the answer is the, the meter is the demarcation line. Um, in Maine, a uh, new single phase service um, is covered, like I think it's 150 feet of line and a 50 kVA transformer. Um, I don't think any of the incentives that Billy was talking about before cover utility side of any of those costs. The three phase power would go to the customer. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to add is they, we do have a rate called DCPT, it used to be called DC fast charging, but it provides a credit on those demand charges as long as you don't hit what's called a coincident peak, which is uh, on the system there's like an hour every month when that would be the peak. So it makes the case for putting in, you know, smart charging or a battery or something like that to avoid what you would forecast to be that peak uh, to help kind of ease those upfront costs until so utilization gets to a point where you have enough revenue to like ease it. That. Uh, Michael's right, you kind of peg, you know, what your use was for your month and you have to pay to make sure that capacity is available. So it's, uh, it's a good rate to kind of help you get where you're inevitably going to get to. So it is the meter, but you could incur costs on the utility side of the meter as well. That's right, yeah. So I don't, I'm not aware of any incentives to cover that. Yeah, and three phase power, the customer in Maine has to pay all those those costs, but uh, single phase uh, utility covers that you know, the initial. Thanks, that's, that's very But that, that's why we've been fortunate to have these public funds to help subsidize that. So that's included in the project cost. So that's, you know, the, the grants are helping cover that which is actually a relief to the main rate payers because otherwise if, if they were going to socialize those costs that would get spread through to the rate payers and we've been trying our hardest to uh, relieve whatever burden that might be by picking it up with these public dollars. Can I touch on the demand charges real briefly just to, to follow up on yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead and then I, I know yeah. we want to so wrap up here soon. Just to put a couple numbers on that, like the because um, the question came up earlier about pricing too and I think that's important. So if you look at the, the NEVI sites that are required to have 600 kilowatts, in CMP territory, your demand charges could be as high as $9,000 a month. In Versa territory, they could be $15,000 a month. Right, so you think about a demand charge that at this peak that you reach, doesn't matter if you reach it every day or you reach it one time during the month, you're assessed that demand charge. So the pricing model, I think, is gonna be influenced a lot by that too, and thinking about how you put these chargers in and what you're charging drivers to use them. If the owner is paying 60% more to operate these chargers in one region, it's gonna be really hard to have kind of a consistent pricing model between them. So I think that's an important thing to consider with, with the pricing models for this. Or we can all go to Van Buren or Kennebunk yeah. and, so and there's, there's they no don't have demand charges. charges. Right. <laughs> uh, question here and then. Yeah, my name is Jacob Reynolds, I'm with the um, Alcide Transportation Museum. We've talked a lot about money, but um, and those numbers have really jumped around. We started at 400 to a million, and now we're down in kind of the tens of thousands. Give me a block range for a, a what is it, a phase two and a phase three installation. Soup to nuts. So <laughs> I'll give it a try. Because we jumped around and I want to understand, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a renovation right now. And, and we, because of the electrical work that we're doing, we may be able to, um, this, we may be able to do something like this with ease. But I'm not clear from all the numbers that have jumped around. I'm not sure if it's a 50000 50, or it's a $400,000 cost right now. If you're putting in a couple of level two chargers that uh, are two two twenty volt, uh, and you have the and they're pub and you have a payment system for those, you know, our we, we've seen lots and lots of these come through our program and we've put rebates on them. You're looking at um, probably something in the fifteen to twenty five thousand dollar 
fifteen to thirty thousand dollars to install that. All in installed phase two charges. Correct for two. Okay, phase three charges. Level two. Just level two. Level, level two. Level two. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Level level two. People are going to yell at you for using phase. Yeah, <laughs> level two chargers. The level three chargers. If you did the same thing with no. level three chargers, and let's say you put in the the smaller end of the spectrum, which was a fifty kW size system, yeah, yeah. you're looking at about. Um, what would you say, Chuck? 150 to 200,000? Yes, starting price, I'd say probably around 150 to 250,000. 500% jump from level two to level three? Yeah. There, yeah, there's a big jump because it requires you have a lot more utility costs we we're just talking about because you're usually going from single phase no, to three all, phase yeah, power. No, like there, there is a big difference between That's what you yeah, want. No, I get the, that's, that's not my concern. My concern is more on the right. so it's like a, it's an order of magnitude. Yeah. There you go. Um, Eric. Uh, I just want to point out, um, it's 10 o'clock, and so some people may need to leave, because uh, that's when we are officially ending. I, I think this conversation can continue for a while if you like, can also break up into smaller groups. Um, when you're leaving, please leave your name tag here, because we'll reuse them. Uh, uh, we forgot to mention a second board member who's here, Dave Nerds. You just wave your hand. So we have 20 members on our board of directors, 10% uh, of them are here today. So, <laughs> um, uh, I also did not mention, I talked about membership. We actually have three memberships for people who work for uh, the state and for local uh, organizations. And so, uh, again, we have a couple members of the legislature here. Uh, we have people who work for the governor's energy office here. Uh, we also have people who are working for uh, public agencies. So you're all welcome to join for three. Um, and the other we take panel, paying memberships too. What? <laughs> we take paying memberships too. <laughs> Yesterday was Giving Tuesday, uh, uh, which, as you may know, is an international campaign now to uh, have uh, individuals give billions of dollars to philanthropic organizations like ours. Uh, I have a couple of business cards here if you want to grab my card uh, as you're leaving. Uh, and then I had a question which no one's really talked about, which is. Uh, there are 8 million people uh, living in Quebec. There are about 7 million people living in Massachusetts. So um, are they coming and using our chargers? Is that 2% oh, of charger use? Is that 10%? Do uh, we have any idea? Well, Tesla or probably all knows. Only being used at by at, at flight deck in the summer, uh, over two thirds are, are New England tourists. Or, oh, excuse me, Northeastern tourists that are not local residents, easily. Two thirds are, are two -thirds. Right. And we And we see between 50 and 65,000 people a year. That's a lot. That's an important part because then we have what ten million tourists every year in the state. We and have forty-two million tourists a year. Forty-two Statewide. million. And Quebec uh, has been a real early mover on uh, EVs. It's going back uh, ten years now, they made huge commitments to expand EVs. As people may know, they have quite uh, inexpensive electricity because of all their hydro generation that is local there and uh, not a lot of easy access to petroleum. So they made an early commitment to move to EVs, big goals, big subsidies. Um, but right when they were really ramping up with their EV adoption, the pandemic hit. So there was no cross-border traffic at all. But we're really hopeful that we start to see that resume. And when we do, we're hoping to see a lot more of their EVs coming across. And I think Joyce's point about the level of traffic up at Presque Isle, um, we know that there, we know from looking at these maps, you can see of where EV chargers are located, that there are sprinkled all along the border uh, in New Brunswick and Quebec. Um, and so we're trying to play catch up, but that tells us that there are people driving EVs on that side of the border. So I think there will be good, good activity there, yeah. Just a thought as the conversation drifted a little bit more into like private in, um, installation and infrastructure, are there incentives and rebates available for the Owl's Head Transportation Museum to be installing that infrastructure or for your home? That so I wouldn't call that private per se if they're uh, a museum that is open to the public. Um, so for your home, right now there are not, with the caveat that we are signing up people who would like to participate in our demand management program. Go on our website and check it out. So if you have an EV, and you charge at home and you are interested in participating in next summer's 
uh, peak demand season, we're subscribing and enrolling customers now. So there's a nice little incentive for you to manage the time of your charging so that you will not do it right when you come home from work and plug in. You can do that, but it's not gonna charge until off peak hours and that will save all ratepayers money and we're gonna need to do that as a state if we want to uh, optimize the size and efficiency of our grid. Uh, so that is the one for private personal use uh, incentive that we have, but we're not currently incentivizing EV chargers at home. But, but for business, I'm sorry, but for businesses or museums or public places, the programs that Lilly is managing do make those available from time to time. So keep your eyes peeled. Yeah, uh, since we're talking about business incentives, uh, I will point out that uh, the other half of this building is the Main Technology Institute, uh, which provides incentives uh, of a different kind uh, to uh, businesses and nonprofits uh, who are interested in developing uh, new technologies or applying technologies that were developed elsewhere uh, but aren't really being presently uh, used in the state of Maine. Uh, they're one of the sponsors for this. Uh, another way to get news about what's going on in the state is uh, the Tech Council has a partnership uh, with Maine Biz. Um, and uh, if you don't get Maine Biz Magazine, um, their weekly, uh, you can get it for free uh, by being active in EG Tech. Uh, and then our third sponsor is a uh, international engineering company, um, ERC, uh, which is based in Portland. So thank, uh, thanks for coming, and I want to thank Lily and Joyce for the panel this morning, and our panelists, uh, Chuck and Christine and Nate. Uh, let's give them a round of applause.